Hello again, just a few more topics to finish up chapter two, a few little loose ends here as we're kind of wrapping up this introduction to uh, organic chemistry and review of general chemistry. Um, the, 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 the last topic I want to talk about for resonance is to tie it in with what we saw in chapter one when we talked about hybridization. So how does a uh, resonance relate to hybridization? So, um, so this uh, topic you'll find in the Klein text in section 13 and talking about uh, the idea of having localized and delocalized lone pairs as well. All right, so uh, when we have a lone pair that is involved in resonance, we say that such a lone pair is delocalized. We describe it as being delocalized because it's spread out over multiple atoms. It's not in one location, it's in several locations, multiple locations. On the other hand, a localized lone pair, a localized lone pair is at a single location. So that's what it means to be localized. You are in one location. In other words, you're not involved in resonance. Okay, so let's take a look at um, a, uh, an example of some resonance. We saw something like this in our last lecture. Uh, the, this lone pair on the nitrogen is next to a pi bond, an allylic lone pair. We said that has resonance, right? Two curved arrows, lone pair becomes a pi bond and pi bond becomes a lone pair. So I can draw a second resonance form for this. As usual, when we move our electrons around, we're gonna move some we're going to create some charges as well or move some charges. So in this case, we have an N plus and an O minus. OK, so knowing that these two resonance forms exist, the question is, what is the hybridization of that nitrogen atom? Of that nitrogen atom? Um, well, in this Lewis structure, we would look at that nitrogen and say, hey, it's got four regions of electron density, has three bonds and a lone pair. So it would be sp3 hybridized. OK, but when we look at it in this Lewis structure, we say, wait a second, this nitrogen actually has three regions of electron density. And so it must be sp2 hybridized. Well, if you remember what we said about resonance, when we when we introduced resonance, we said that that atoms don't move in resonance. So I can't be going from tetrahedral to trigonal planar. Bond lengths don't change. Bond angles don't change. The atoms are frozen. OK, so guess what? This nitrogen was never sp3. It was sp2 from the beginning. It must be sp2 in both resonance forms. It must have the same hybridization in both. OK, and so um, what's going on here? <laughs> well, it turns out that when we that when we use this curved arrow to move the allylic lone pair to share it over, over here and, and dis redistribute it, um, it must have been in a p orbital in order for that to have happened. Okay, so if the uh, nitrogen is sp2 hybridized, remember sp2 means you have trigonal planar with a p orbital, and the middle carbon is sp2 hybridized, trigonal planar with a p orbital, and the oxygen atom is sp2 hybridized with a p orbital, what we really have is the electrons in that from that pi bond and from that lone pair are all being delocalized, shared over these three p, p orbitals. So we have four electrons over three p orbitals. Right, we have a pi bond and we have a lone pair. So there's four total electrons and it's really just completely delocalized over that system. Okay, so so that lone pair must have been in a p orbital here. It must have been in a p orbital, and that's how it can interact with the p orbitals of the pi bond. Okay, so again, we're going to come back to this a little later. I have a little, I have a picture at the at the end here um, uh, to show some of this too. You know what? Let me let me see if I could jump to that picture because that might help. This is another picture of an allylic lone pair, an allylic lone pair doing resonance. Lone pair becomes a pi bond, pi bond becomes a lone pair. Okay, and so as soon as I do that resonance, that means that the lone pair must have been in a p orbital to do that. The only way you could have a p orbital is if 
these are all um, S, uh, that carbon is sp2 hybridized. In fact, all three carbons in this allylic system are sp2 hybridized. So you can imagine having the lone pair is in a p orbital and the pi bond is between two p orbitals. And then when I look at my second resonance form, now the lone pair is in this p orbital and the pi bond is shifted between the other two p orbitals. So that's a way of looking at those you know, distinct two Lewis structures, those two resonance forms. Of course, the real structure, the real structure is that blend where all four electrons are just being shared over all three p orbitals. Okay, what else can you do with p orbitals? We saw that p orbitals can be shared, can share two electrons. That's how we describe a pi bond. That's what's known as a pi bond. And sometimes a p orbital is empty. Anytime you have a carbocation, a carbocation is sp2 hybridized. This carbon is sp2 hybridized because it has just three regions of electron density around it. So it's trigonal planar. And this p orbital is empty, is empty. There's nothing in it. There's no lone pair. It's just an empty p orbital. Okay, so um, we will come back to this. We will come back to this idea of using p orbitals in resonance uh, down the road, but I just wanted to make sure I had that introduced to you uh, early on. Okay, so when you have a lone pair like this that's being involved in resonance, we call, describe that as being delocalized because now it's being shared, it's being spread out. So let's see if we can identify other delocalized lone pairs. Uh, let's look at a few more interesting organic molecules. This molecule is serotonin. Serotonin is a uh, uh, naturally occurring neurotransmitter that we have in our brain that is kind of the, the happy drug. This is uh, when you have good levels of serotonin. That's, what, that's when you're in a good mood and, and life is good. Um, it's uh, super important for regulating your sleep. You know, it's not just your mood, but also your sleep, your appetite. It has a role in memory and a, a host of other things. And so, um, so many uh, antidepressant medications work by, um, by boosting the level of, uh, of serotonin in your body. Um, uh, psychedelic mushrooms, psilocybin, and uh, those sorts of uh, hallucinogens also can uh, ha have an effect on serotonin as well. So very interesting molecule. Um, let's see if we have uh, any lone pairs. Let's add any missing lone pairs. And uh, any, any oxygen or nitrogen would have lone pairs. These are all neutral. So I know that's oxygen would have two lone pairs. This nitrogen would have a lone pair and this nitrogen would have a lone pair. Okay, and now how can I decide if it is localized or delocalized? If it is involved in resonance, that's when we describe it as delocalized. So how would it be involved in resonance if it is allylic, if it is next to next to a pi bond? So here we have a pi bond and the lone pair is not on the pi bond, it's the next atom over. That is an allylic lone pair. So two curved arrows, lone pair becomes a pi bond, pi bond becomes a lone pair. The lone pair on the oxygen is delocalized, is delocalized. Okay, how about on the nitrogen? The, the nitrogen that's in the ring, the nitrogen that's in the ring, that's actually allylic to this pi bond, it's allylic to this pi bond. And so either way you go, you would see again, there is resonance possibility here. Lone pair becomes a pi bond, pi bond becomes a lone pair. I'm not drawing the next resonance structure. I'm just recognizing that this also must be a delocalized electron. Uh, pair of electrons delocalized, delocalized. Okay, and our last nitrogen, our last nitrogen has no adjacent pi bond, right? It's not allylic, not an allylic lone pair. There is no pi bond. I can't do this resonance. Why can't I just do that resonance? Why can't I just move that lone pair? Because this carbon has two hydrogens here, this, is a, this has a filled lactate. I can't just add a fifth bond. I can't just add a fifth bond. There is no resonance. There is no resonance here. So how would we describe that lone pair? It is localized, localized. In other words, it's just sitting on that nitrogen, nowhere else to go, nothing else it can do. It is not involved in resonance. 
Very good. One more example. How about this guy? This is aspartame. Aspartame is a uh, uh, goes by the brand name NutraSweet. So this is a sweetener that's uh, 200 times or so sweeter than sucrose. We saw sucrose earlier in the lecture, earlier in chapter two, table sugar. So this is super, super sweet, but it's essentially no calories. So it's, it's used as an artificial sweetener to, uh, to lower calories. So um, lots of lone pairs here, lots of lone pairs. Every oxygen, neutral oxygen has two lone pairs. Every neutral oxygen has two lone pairs. And every neutral nitrogen has a lone pair as well. Okay, so does this have uh, any uh, resonance? Any of these lone pairs involved in resonance? Well, when we have a lone pair that is next to a pi bond, it can have resonance. So this oxygen down here, let me, sorry, go to red. This lone pair can have resonance delocalization, right? So this one is delocalized. But the lone pairs that are up here on this oxygen, these are not next to a pi bond. They are on the pi bond. They cannot have that same allylic lone pair resonance. So those lone pairs can never leave the oxygen atom. They are localized. They are localized. Okay, how about these two nitrogens? One of these, it has an allylic lone pair. The other does not. One of these is allylic and the other is not. The one that's directly attached to the carbonyl has just the right relationship where I can do my allylic lone pair resonance, right? So the, this, uh, the lone pair on this nitrogen is delocalized, but the one up here is localized. It has no, it has no pi bond. If I can bring this down, that would just violate the octet on that carbon and there's no pi bond that can move. So that's just special about being allylic is you form a new bond, but then you also break a bond at the same time. You never, this carbon never exceeds four bonds. It always has exactly four bonds. You add a bond and you take a bond away, right? Whichever direction my arrow starts, the next arrow goes in that same direction because I'm adding a bond and then I'm taking a bond away. Okay, and finally with our other carbonyl, with our other carbonyl, Again, the oxygen that is adjacent to the carbonyl, there's resonance here. So this is a this is a delocalized lone pair, but up on the carbonyl, the oxygen that's on the double bond, those pot, those lone pairs can never go anywhere. Same thing with this oxygen, localized, localized. So that allylic lone pair resonance is key. Fantastic. Skill builder, skill builder, 2.9. 2.9 is all about identifying localized and delocalized lone pairs. Okay, last but not least, in chapter two, you're going to see an introduction to the idea of, of functional groups. Um, and uh, it's it's pretty early in the, in the chapter 2.3. Now is a good time to kind of talk about the concept of functional groups, but this is not something I'm gonna have you memorize at this time. We're gonna be learning these functional groups one by one gradually throughout the entire year of organic chemistry. And at that time, I'm gonna have you learn their names. I'm gonna have you learn how to name them and so on. Okay, but if you're taking, um, let's say you're taking the 3140 lab, you might start hearing these names, ethers and amides and esters and ketones. And so if you have no idea what those words mean, then, then you're going to have a hard time following along. So I do want to introduce them to you and give you some familiarity, but this is not something that I'm going to, is going to be on an exam. Okay. Um, so what is a functional group? A functional group is an arrangement of elements, a common typical arrangement of elements um, that gives it predictable behavior. So they all kind of are related. So for example, for example, if you have an OH on a structure, we call those compounds alcohols and all alcohols kind of have certain behaviors. So we're gonna have a chapter, chapter 13, we're gonna learn about alcohols, we're gonna learn about the kinds of reactions they do, how to synthesize them and so on, how to name them um, and so on. So, um, so here's an example of an alcohol, this uh, a generic 
form for an alcohol would just be ROH, where R, anytime you see the letter R in organic chemistry, it just means you have some kind of carbon chain, some kind of carbon group, doesn't matter what carbon group it is. Um, so any kind of carbon group here it could be a two carbon chain, a three carbon chain, a 50 carbon chain, we would still call all those alcohols, an alcohol functional group. And we'll learn how to name them. This would be called methanol and there's ethanol, propanol, butanol, pentanol, and so on. Okay, so um, so what are the functional groups we're gonna learn um, this semester in Chem 3140? The very first functional group um, is actually, <laughs> the lack of functional groups is just called an alkane. So that's when all you have is carbons and hydrogens. Um, uh, that that uh, something like methane, we saw methane as a structure. That is an example of, of a class of compounds called alkanes. They lack any other functional group. They lack any functionality, okay? Um, when you put a halogen on a carbon chain, like a chloride, bromide, iodide, something like that, uh, we could abbreviate those as just Rx. Remember, I said that we're going to use the letter X to represent a halogen. Um, and those are described as alkyl halides. We're going to learn about those in chapter seven. We'll learn how to name those and we'll learn the three actions that they undergo. Uh, and then all the other functional groups we're going to learn this semester are alkenes and alkynes. Alkene is what we call it when we have a carbon-carbon double bond, and alkyne is what we call it when we have a carbon-carbon triple bond. Alkenes and alkynes. So that's it. We're learning very few functional groups, very few types of carbon uh, groups, uh, organic groups in first semester organic. That's because we're just going to spend a lot of our time, like the first half of the semester, kind of learning the language of organic chemistry and the mechanics and this and that, so how to draw structures, how to uh, uh, you know, uh, think about reactivity and so on. Okay, now when we move to 3150, holy cow, this is kind of the march of the functional groups, isn't it? We're gonna, we're gonna learn every other functional group in 3150. We're just gonna kind of, each chapter has its own. Um, so an alcohol is what you call it when you have uh, uh, an OH. It's called an ether when you have an oxygen again, but now you have a carbon chain on either side. So R-O-R, R-O-R is uh, the, the general structure of an ether functional group. We call it an amine when you have a nitrogen attached. Okay, and notice the whole, this entire group here, this whole group, this subcategory, all of these are related because they have a CO double bond. And what is that CO double, double bond called? It's called a carbonyl group, a carbonyl functional group. And you will see that there's lots of uh, arrangements of, those, of, of such compounds. When you have a hydrogen attached, we call that an aldehyde. When you have just carbon groups on both sides, we call that ketone. And, uh, and then when you have something other than carbon or hydrogen, we have all sorts of varieties here. We have a carboxylic acid, acid chloride, ester, amide, and hydride. We'll be learning about all those together. They're called carboxylic acid derivatives. So one by one, we're gonna be learning all these. We'll learn about nitriles. And then this last guy, we said how special benzene is, the special um, resonance that benzene has. It's actually characteristic of an entire class of compounds, a functional group called being aromatic, being aromatic. So if you ever see the abbreviation AR, that stands for aromatic. And it means you have something like a benzene ring, cyclic structure with alternating pi bonds and so on. So that is, aromatic compounds. So I'm not going to test you on any of those names, but you're going to hear those names being thrown around, especially in lab. And so you want to, uh, you want to have this table handy to look those up uh, so you can, you can communicate. All right. So that's it for chapter two. Very, very brief chapter. It really is all about residence, deep dive into residence. I'm going to have a homework assignment to give you extra practice in residence, a free writing homework, um, because it's, it's a critical, critical skill that I promise you we're gonna be using every single chapter pretty much from here on out, we're gonna be tapping into resonance. Um, so the, here's the, um, the uh, summary of chapter two. And you could see I've highlighted the, uh, the corresponding skill builders in chapter problems and the conceptual checkpoints in chapter problems based on each section, uh, cause I reorganized things just a little bit. And, uh, and those are all great problems for you to practice uh, and, and then when you're, when you're done with those, then you can move on to the end of chapter problems to kind of practice it all together.
All right. So that wraps it up for chapter two. Hope you have a great rest of the day and I will see you next time.